who Scott is. So Scott is uh, the pastor of Calvary Christian Fellowship uh, over by I-10 and uh, Prince yeah. uh, area. So you see it driving down the road. Scott's been a good friend of mine um, since we were both in our early 20s and, uh, and mid-20s. Since we were both in our mid-20s and uh, God's knit a really neat relationship between us. I'm really glad that he could come here. Uh, he'll be bringing a tour next year probably, huh? Of your own. Yeah. So really excited. So I've asked him to teach from the Beatitudes here. So would you guys please welcome my friend Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it is just staggering to uh, to be here in Israel. And one of the reasons that I, I'm here on this tour not leading one is, and I really think this is the Lord's wisdom, was the first time I came here, I knew I would be standing around just with my eyes like saucers trying to take all of this in. And it is such a blessing just to be able to soak all of this up. And I, I keep coming back to one overwhelming thought, and I hope you do too, that you know, when we're looking around here, we look out at this, this sea of Galilee, we see the sunrise, we're seeing the very same perspective that Jesus had when he saw these things. You know, when we stand in these places, like in the synagogue in Capernaum, obviously we're standing on top of a uh, building that is built on top of that synagogue, but that's where our Lord spoke. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the reality behind all of this. One of the things that I often uh, say to our people is that when we are talking about the message of Jesus, the Gospels do not begin to deliver a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Uh, we are talking about absolute reality. God invading this world that we live in in a very practical way. And, and, and so it is just uh, an amazing privilege to be able to stand before you here in this place, probably somewhere near, uh, where Jesus originally gave the Sermon on the Mount, and share with you just for a few minutes uh, a, a very important section of this. We, we couldn't do the whole Sermon on the Mount. We'd be here all day probably. But, but uh, let's pray and let's commit this time in the Word <coughs> to Him. Father, what a privilege that you have worked in each and every one of our lives, sovereignly and supernaturally, to bring us to this place where we can meet with you and where we can listen to your voice and, and, and where your Word can take on a depth and a fullness of meaning for us that we, we couldn't find anywhere else. Uh, Lord, a, as we explore just for the next few moments the amazing words that your son spoke uh, about the, the, the character and heart of those who would belong to his kingdom, I pray you'd speak to us about our character and our heart and our relationship with you and the things that you would love to do within our lives. Thank you for this amazing privilege of, of serving you and being a part of your forever family. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, Matthew chapter 5 uh, begins with these words, And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth. Now, this is such a significant point uh, where we need to grab some context here. In, in Matthew's gospel, uh, we're told that Jesus went all about Galilee. Well, here we are in Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went through all, out, throughout all Syria. Now, again, moving up to the Golan and, and the areas where we have been. Uh, they were hearing about him there, and they brought to him all the sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed. Probably people have been hanging out at the uh, Temple of Pan too long up there. <laughs> Epileptics and paralytics, and, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from the Decapolis, as, as we were pointed out, across the, the, the Sea of Galilee from here. And, and we'll probably see that as the uh, tour uh, uh, unfolds from Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. So Jesus, in essence, is the hottest ticket in town at this point. You know, he is doing things unlike anybody else has ever done in human history. And boy, where there's a need, there's going to be a stampede right? People are all over what's going on here. Now, speculation was rife uh, among people about who this Jesus really was. You know, why could he do these signs and wonders? There was this anticipation in the, the world at that time, uh, not just in Jewish culture, but across the board, that uh, a significant ruler was going to be born. Obviously, the Jews saw this as the, the promise of the Messiah. 
Could Jesus be the Messiah? People were making up their minds. But they were seeing his works, but, you know, they're, they're saying, okay, we, we've seen these miracles, but what is he really all about? What kind of a message is he here to share? In Matthew's Gospel, this is the first time that people are going to hear what we could call the manifesto of the Messiah. Uh, what, what Jesus would define his ministry as being, what his teaching would actually be. And so you better believe that as the, the, the people sat and listen to Jesus. Uh, there, there wasn't crosstalk going on. You know, there, there wasn't people saying, hey, you know, you know, or you get some of those Magnum bars or something. <laughs> no, no. People, people were hanging on his every word. And so when it says he opened his mouth, you have to realize and, and, and put yourself in that situation of the intensity, the drama of, of that particular moment. <coughs> so what does he say when he finally speaks? To the, in the first time to a, to a large public gathering. Well, he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, notice the first thing that Jesus speaks of, the first word that comes out of his mouth is the Hebrew word ashe, ashe which literally means happy or blessed. In the Greek, this is very, very vivid. Uh, the word that is, is used here in the Greek New Testament is the word makarios, it, it was a very vivid and picturesque word. It, it was a word that was used to describe, well, I, I guess what we would call a, a resort island in, in the, the minds of the Greeks. If you've ever had uh, one of those uh, times, especially in Tucson during one of those hot monsoon days, and you think, oh, wouldn't it be great to get away and be on a nice white sandy beach, sitting in the shade of a palm tree, uh, drinking some outrageous calorie bomb beverage or something like that. Well, that's what Makarios was all about. It was a legendary place. It was like paradise. It was like, 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 like Shangri-La. It was supposed to be the perfect place where all of your needs could be met. Well, Jesus begins, and, and this word translated from the Greek carries the idea <coughs> of being supremely happy. So happy, you can't contain it. Uh, you know, I have a friend who uh, oftentimes you'll say, uh, you know, how are you doing? And he said, well, if I was doing any better, I'd have to take something for it. <laughs> you know, that's the level of happiness we're talking about here. And maybe you've experienced it. I know I certainly did. Uh, the, the, the first morning where I got up and watched the sun coming up over uh, Galilee from, from that patio area down there and, and realizing that I was watching the very same sunrise that Jesus watched there. I just began to, to, to weep, not because I was sad, but because I just couldn't contain the emotion. Well, that's the level of happiness that Jesus is talking about here. It's not circumstantial happiness. You know, usually we define happiness in that kind of a, you know, oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling. Everything's going my way. You know, that's how we define happiness. But Jesus said the kind of happiness, the kind of fulfillment, the kind of satisfaction that he was going to bring ran an awful lot deeper than that. And boy, let me tell you something. You talk about happiness with people, you strike, you strike a chord. You ask the average person in this world, well, what do you want out of life? What are they going to say? Well, I want to be happy. You know, and, 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 and if you, you probe that a little bit more, people have different definitions. Yeah, I think we all want to be happy. And, and Jesus recognizes that, but he paints a pathway in this passage to true happiness that's a lot different and maybe the one that we would choose or, or, or would ever even enter our mind. You see, Jesus' definition of happiness isn't external. It, it, it's not even sensual. It doesn't have anything to do with our feelings. It's something that happens just from the inside out. Listen to these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now notice the first thing that Jesus says about the kind of people that would be a part of his kingdom is first and foremost they would be Poor in spirit. 
the word poor here again is very vivid. It's the Greek word pitokos. It carries the idea not just of say somebody who goes, oh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of poor. I drive a beater car, you know, or oh, I'm poor. I can't afford premium cable. You know, that's how we define someone who's kind of down on their luck. This kind of poverty uh, spoke of, of being poor on the level of being a beggar, uh, uh, of being so dependent upon other people's charity that if uh, someone doesn't lend you a hand, you're not going to make it. It's hardcore, third world, go to India and watch it happen kind of poverty that is being described here. Now, now why such a vivid, such a jarring word? Well, well what Jesus is saying here is that if we're going to be part of his forever family, uh, we, we can't come in with this idea that somehow we're bringing something to the party. You know, that, that, that somehow God looked at us and said, oh, they're just so cute and so adorable. Look, they walked a little away. I've got to save them. No, it's this idea of being absolutely spiritually bankrupt. He said, that's the first step to getting into the kingdom. Well, well stop and think about it. That's the message of grace, right? You know, God's riches at Christ's expense, not based on anything I could possibly ever do or earn or, or, or merit on my favor but only on the mercy of God. And, and that's such a jarring message for so many in our culture. You know, I, I don't know how many of you have had conversations uh, with uh, people who say, well, if God wants me to believe in him, then he needs to do X and such. You know, why doesn't he reveal himself to, to me in the sky? Or, you know, Woody Allen, I think, once said, if, if only God would give me a clear sign, like making a, a large deposit in my name in a Swiss bank account. That's, yeah. that's kind of what we're looking for. But that's the opposite of being poor in spirit. What does poor, being poor in spirit look like in practice? Well, maybe the best example we find in Scripture of that uh, is something that goes on later in the book of Matthew. Jesus' encounter with a Syrophoenician woman whose daughter was cruelly demon-possessed. Remember, she came to Jesus and, and, and was saying, please do something for my daughter. And Jesus doesn't even answer her. The disciples said, send her away. Come on. We, we, we need face time with a great man. She's, she's interrupting us. And, and she's not letting up. And Jesus says something radical to her. <laughs> Basically, she says, you know, hey, I was only sent to the lost children of Israel. It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the little puppies. That, that, that was the, the, the word. Well, I don't know about you, but Jesus said something like that to me. I said, well, I got my dignity. You know, I, I'm no little puppy here. You know, you're not going to call me a dog and get away with it. But, but, but she persisted, and, and what she said was really remarkable. She said, yes, Lord, but even the little puppies get crumbs from the master's table. Exactly. Now, basically what she was saying is, even a crumb from you, Jesus, is be more than enough to meet my need. Now, that's the opposite of being proud, right? That's being poor in spirit. That, that's it. For, call me a dog. Do whatever you want. I, I, I need you. You know, I'm going to overcome it. And remember what Jesus says in response to that. She says to, he says to this woman, Woman, great is your faith. Be it done to you as you believe. Now, <laughs> it's really significant. The disciples are trying to shoo this woman away. She's a Gentile. She's a woman. Ah, you know, all this stuff. You know, I hope, hope I don't get any green worm from her or something like that. <laughs> you know, don't, don't pet the Syrophoenician woman. That's, <laughs> but, but, but... You know, Jesus never said to his disciples, great is your faith. I mean, the closest he came was, if your faith was the size of a mustard seed, you'd be getting somewhere, guys. That, that's what being poor in spirit is all about. You know, it's been said that the way into the kingdom of heaven is narrow. That's true. But it's also low. Nobody gets in without bowing. No one gets in with baggage. No one gets in saying, you know, well, you know, I, I'm going to negotiate a deal with you guys. You go, save me or I'm done. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus. And, 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 you know, again, as Steve, the tour guide, has pointed out, the, the idea of Phariseeism, the idea that, that, that I'm holding up my end in, in, in a relationship with God, right? This would have rocked their world. You know, they, they thought they were God's chosen. They thought they were a credit to the kingdom. No, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they, are, they shall be comforted. Mourn? Scott, I thought we were going to talk about happiness here. What are you talking about mourning all of a sudden? Well, this isn't mourning like, say, grieving the loss of a loved one. This is mourning in a very significant and special way. This is being broken 
and mourning over the fact that you realize you're not all that in a bag of chips. You know, that you, you are lost and you, that you are alienated from God. Mm -hmm. that, that, that you realize what a grievous thing your sin really is. You know, that it's not just, well, you know, uh, nobody's perfect. <laughs> you know, we've all got our little quirks, our little eccentricities. Oh, this is just the way I am. You gotta accept. No, it, it's seeing what is separated us from God and being broken over it. Now, now notice those who mourn are going to be comforted. In, in, in other words, you come to God with that kind of brokenness of spirit and say, God, you know, be merciful to me, me a sinner. You know, he's not going to go, well, I'm glad you finally perceived that. Now, now get out of my sight. I can't stand you. No, he's instead going to receive you. He's going to heal you. He's going to forgive you. It's just a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, the, the idea uh, of mourning and comfort. Remember what King David said in Psalm 51? Uh, he, he said this in verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken heart, a broken and contrite spirit. These, O oh Lord, you won't despise. So a person who enters into the kingdom, first of all, realizes they're spiritually bankrupt. Then they're broken, they're mourning <laughs> over sin because they're going to find comfort. They're going to find the forgiveness that God can provide for us. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Notice it goes on, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now notice it doesn't say weak here, it says meek. It's a very different term. The term meek in, the, in Greek carried the idea of strength under control. It, it was a word that was used to describe a perfectly trained war horse that would be instantly responsive to the, the slightest direction from its rider. Well, if you've ever been around uh, you know, a horse, uh, <laughs> horses are pretty perceptive. They can figure out who's who and what's what in a hurry. And if you show fear around them, you know, they'll, they'll tend to take advantage of you a bit. I mean, they're large, powerful creatures. But a meek horse, a well-trained horse, a, a horse that instantly responds to its master's command, that's something different. Well, this idea of power under control, control. Well, maybe the whole idea of self-control. Well, that's a big part uh, of the kingdom of God, isn't it? Blessed are the meek, that is, those who haven't mastered all their faults and flaws, but have allowed the master to master those faults and flaws. Those who have that power under control, those who look to the Lord to minister in and through them, the, the meek, the ones that take a step back, the ones who don't say, hey, I got my rights, or, or you gotta treat me in this way, or so. No, they shall inherit the earth. You know, in, in Psalm 34, this same statement is made, and there's a beautiful promise attached to it. It says, the meek shall inherit the earth and delight themselves in abundance of peace. <laughs> Boy, you come to that place in your walk with God, the peace of God comes in you because you realize, hey, I don't have to manage my life. I don't have to get mine. God's going to be my provision. He's going to look out for me. Notice it says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now, now this idea of Hungering and thirsting for righteousness. Now, remember something. Righteousness isn't, uh, you know, the, the, the way we usually portray it. We usually substitute the word self-righteous in there. You know, the, the, the individuals that are, you know, kind of uh, looking around and, and kind of doing the sin sniffing. And, you know, they're the propriety police. And, boy, they're going to straighten everybody out. You know, that, that's what we kind of think. But righteousness, in this sense, literally all it means is a right relationship with God. Those of us who hunger and thirst for this, this right relationship with God, are going to be satisfied, not just spiritually, but in every other way. Later on in the Sermon on the Mount, remember Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, which sung it as a praise chorus for years. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. Righteousness. And what? All these things will be added unto you. Beautiful. You hunger and thirst for righteousness, you're going to be filled. You're never going to walk away unsatisfied if that's your priority in life. Now notice it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Man, when we begin to realize we are right with God based on what he has done for us, not based on anything we could ever do for anyone else, that when we were at our worst, Romans chapter 5 and verse 8 says, Jesus died for us. Well, that changes the way we look at people. 
or, or it will if you properly understand what God has done for you. Mm -hmm. Because we've received so much from God, so much unconditional love from God, the true person who has been touched by the love of God shares out of that overflow. You know, they, they have that mentality. Well, in light of all that Jesus has done for me, how in the world can I possibly hold a grudge? How can I possibly hold something over somebody else? Or, or get in a, well, I might forgive you, but I'll never forget it kind of a thing. <laughs> Boy, would you want God to deal with you in that way? I would. But those who are merciful will receive that mercy, that, that, this beautiful, uh, you know, positive kind of a, a spiral goes on within our lives. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You know, right along the line, we, we talk about this. We're, we're tracking pretty good until we get to verse 8. Yeah. Pure in heart. How many of you here today believe you are pure in heart? Yeah. You know, that, that kind of leaves us out, right? You know, as far as, as anything that we can do to... It, 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 right here, religion <laughs> dies, if you will. And, and as we've seen, it, especially <coughs> when Jesus goes head-to-head -to -head with the scribes and the Pharisees, the most religious people of his time, Jesus said, you are like whitewashed tombs. You look great on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and all corruption. You know, we, we can easily buy into that mentality, kind of like the old uh, Billy Crystal routine from Saturday Night Live. It's better to rook spiritual than to be spiritual. <laughs> you know, as long as I'm putting it over on somebody else and can talk to God, talk, it doesn't really matter if I'm a jerk outside of church. You know, I, I've come to believe there's, there, there must be some kind of magic aura uh, around uh, church, at least our church anyway, probably about, oh, I'd say uh, 300, 400 yards out, uh, because people will be coming in and they will be at each other's throats, and I mean, ah, yeah, I can't believe it, ah, ah. and then they, they pass this beer and it's like, <laughs> they go to me and they go, oh, pastor, I art rejoicing with much joy and wailing and national of you. Pardon me while I straighten my halo. <laughs> Well, I, I tell people often, and, and I'm not sure people get it, but, but I try to reiterate this point a lot, you know. It doesn't matter what I think of your spirit. You know, Judgment Day, Jesus is never going to say, oh, you're here, hey, where's Scott? Scott, do you think they belong in the kingdom? No, Judgment Day is not going to be done by majority vote. The only person's opinion on Judgment Day that matters is God. Amen. And guess what? He's 24-7. I want to share with you now one of the scariest scriptures you'll ever hear. You want to hear something really scary here today? Hebrews 13.5, God said, I will never leave you and never forsake you. Why is that so scary? Isn't that comforting? Well, I guess it can be a double-edged sword, but well, let's face it. You know, there's times where we would all want to say, okay, God, um, could you take five and, and, and just busy yourself with managing the universe for a while, and I'll get back to you in just a minute. God will never do that. God is always looking at us. God always loves us. He can't take his eyes off of us. He won't take his eyes off of us. So this idea of being pure in heart, it's not something we can work up, gang. It's only something we can receive as a gift. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives that purifies us positionally because of what Jesus has done for us. You and I are as pure as we will ever be. God sees you in Christ. You are clothed with the very righteousness of Jesus. He sees you just as righteous as Jesus because of your faith in him. But there's also that practical righteousness, that practical purification, that, 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 that move within our lives where, where God kind of takes away the distance between where we are in heavenly reality and where we are in the here and there. And he's going to always be about that business. Now it says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now this isn't just uh, referring to people that get to, in between uh, two folks that are kind of at odds with each other. I, I, I remember uh, the, one of the single best pieces of advice I've ever received in, in my entire Christian ministry came from Robert. Uh, there was a, a, a guy who was an auto mechanic that I, I've seen, and, and he got sideways with his pastor over something, and they were having this big dispute, and 
And he said, well, could you sit down with me and this other pastor and kind of be the mediator? And, and I was going, well, you know, listen to peacemakers and all that stuff. And I, Robert, what do you think? And he just kind of smiled and he said, you know, in Proverbs it says, better to take a dog by the ears than to get involved with a quarrel that is not your own. <laughs> and I said, thank you for that moment of clarity. <laughs> and I stayed out of it, man. <laughs> We got a saying in Calvary Chapel, so don't go looking for trouble, it's going to come looking for you. You know? So, so what is this peacemaker stuff all about? Well, it's not just patching up rough relations, although there's a place for that in our walk with God. It's the ultimate peacemaker, right? The, the, the ultimate broken relationship is not on the horizontal, it's on the vertical. When we share the love of Jesus Christ, when we tell them that Jesus died in their place to pay the price for their sins, and he rose from the dead in a moment of history so that they can have life. And if they pray and receive Christ as their Savior, they can be reconciled to a right relationship with God. Guess what happens? The war between God and that person is over. That's peace, man. If you got that peace in your heart vertically, amazing how the peace horizontally starts to take over. And finally, Jesus said, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> what Jesus is saying here is, guess what? You want to be really happy? Get persecuted. What? That just doesn't seem to make any sense. You know, isn't happiness avoiding trouble? Well, you know what? There are some things in life worth suffering for, aren't there? You know, unless you figure that out, unless you put all that together uh, and, and decide, you know, th there's really a hill or two in life that you're going to die on. You're just going to bounce from thing to thing and place to place. And, you know, ducking and covering is not the way to a satisfying life. But what Jesus was saying is this. Look, if you take a stand for me, this world is not going to give you a high five. Jeffrey Van Vonderen, the, the Christian counselor, put it this way. If you say the same sort of things that Jesus said, the same sort of people he said them to, you're going to get what he got. Period. Yeah, and we're, we're going to be treated the same way Jesus is. But, but what a compliment, in a sense, to be treated like Jesus, to stand with him, not just in terms of anticipation of heavenly blessing, but standing with him, even if it means a little blasting in our life. That's where meaning and purpose and significance comes out in our lives. So, so all these things, right? You know, Jesus starts out and he completely resets what a relationship with God is all about. This is one of the most radical messages that has ever been preached down through time, not just for the people who heard it probably not far from here the first time, but even in our lives individually. You know, and, and, and the question that, that we need to ask ourselves is, is this. Where do you look for happiness in this life? What has to be true in your life in order for you to be supremely happy? Is it having a certain level of, of money in your IRA? I, I, is it being able to take an amazing trip like this? You know, I, as amazing as this is, it's gonna, it's gonna pass. You know, where do you find your sense of happiness? Is it keeping everybody in your life happy all at the same time? Well, I've tried to perform that fool's errand a few times in my life, and it never works and it never ends. Here's where you find happiness. You find it in the character of Jesus Christ. You find it in his faithfulness because the only one I've ever known who is poor in spirit, who mourned, who was meek, who hungered and thirsted for righteousness without exception, who was merciful, who was pure in heart, who was a peacemaker, and was persecuted for righteousness' sake, sake every time. It wasn't you and it wasn't me. It was Jesus. These beatitudes, you see, lead us to the person of Jesus because he's everything we're not. But the beautiful thing is, when he comes into our heart, he makes us much more than we ever dreamed that we could be. And that's the exciting vision of the Christian life. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we, we just scratched the surface of what you said in the Sermon on the Mount, the radical things that you shared. Uh, not too far from here, the, the context of it, just seeing where this happened, just blows me away. But, but even more, Lord, blow us away with your truth. Blow us away with your love. Blow us away with your grace during this trip. God, show us uh, the, the, the distance between who you are and who we are and, and, and the glorious vision that you can give to us uh, of being more than we ever dreamed that we could be. 
because of your miraculous power living in us and, and, and overflowing us and changing us and transforming us. We don't want old, cold, dead religion. We don't want to have keep out signs in our hearts to you. Lord, we want to see you change and transform us. And, and God, it's our prayer, and I think we would agree together, that our desire more than anything else is that we would be new and different people by the time we head back home. Continue to do this awesome work. Continue to give us this beautiful sense of awe being in this place where all these amazing things went down. And thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus. We love you, and we love you. In his name and for his sake, amen. amen. amen.